We're going to start this with uh, Dr. Ann Bass, who is coming from Hospital for Special Surgery across the street uh, in our uh, rheumatology group to talk about new ways that we're thinking about musculoskeletal toxicity. I think this is a, a side effect that we didn't appreciate a lot initially, and now the more you look, the more you find everyone is having some kind of achy joint. So make some sense of that for us, Ann. Thanks very, not, uh, very much, and it's uh, great to be able to talk to a room full of uh, oncologists. I've learned a lot today. Uh, so I'll talk about musculoskeletal toxicity. I have no disclosures because I'm a rheumatologist. Um, so there are a variety of rheumatic toxicities listed here in kind of decreasing uh, frequency, but I'm really going to focus on inflammatory arthritis today. Um, I'll talk about the clinical presentation, uh, what we know about biology of this condition, which is not that much. Um, and then I'm not going to give you a treatment algorithm, uh, but I'll talk about targeted biologic therapies that we use in rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis, for example, that we sometimes pull out to use uh, arthritis as an adverse event and, and others that we don't usually use, uh, but there might be a rationale for their use. So inflammatory arthritis, meaning where there's actual joint swelling, occurs in about 4% of uh, checkpoint inhibitor-treated patients. If you look at arthralgia, which means joint pain uh, or arthritis with swelling, it occurs in about 8%, um, a little bit more common with uh, PD-1 blockade, uh, and even more common with combination uh, than with ibalimumab alone. Um, and many of these patients are really indistinguishable from rheumatoid arthritis patients. And for those of you who don't remember, from medical school, rheumatoid arthritis gives you a symmetrical polyarthritis involving the large and the small joints, the MCPs and PIPs, uh, as well as the large joints. It can occur early, uh, almost immediately after the first dose of checkpoint inhibitors or out to 93 weeks. Um, in our registry across the street, uh, the median time of onset was, uh, is 3.1 months with a wide range. Um, but uh, in this study that Laura Capelli did down at Hopkins, she looked at the time of onset of the actual symptoms and then the time to referral to rheumatology. And what you can see is that uh, if the knees were inflamed and swollen and the patient couldn't walk, they were referred very quickly. But if they had small joint involvement, i.e. this rheumatoid arthritis presentation, there was a big delay uh, up to eight months before they were sent to the rheumatologist. Um, checkpoint inhibitor arthritis uh, can look like RA, but it's a clinically heterogeneous uh, syndrome. It can uh, uh, present as polymyalgia rheumatica with achiness in the shoulder and the hip girdle region. It can present as a large joint arthritis, just the knees and ankles, for example, um, or just joint pain or arthralgia. Or we can see this enthesitis or tenosynovitis presentation where just the tendon sheath is swollen or there's inflammation at the insertion of a tendon like the triceps uh, tendon. Uh, and this is a little bit reminiscent of the sp spondyloarthropathies like psoriatic arthritis, but this is seen in a minority. Um, so this is the, uh, the registry that we have at HSS. Um, it's a prospective registry. We've recruited uh, 43 patients with inflammatory arthritis uh, to date in the last year or so. Um, uh, the median age is 65. Uh, majority are women. Uh, majority are white, I think reflecting more the referral pattern from Memorial. Half of them are smokers, which is certainly more than in the general population. Um, and that's uh, of interest because smoking is actually a risk factor for rheumatoid arthritis. 70% um, of the patients received PD-1 or PD-L1 monotherapy. And over time, as we followed these patients, a third of them have had a progression. Uh, and a third of them have melanoma, also kind of reflecting the, uh, I think, the referral bias. 64% have this rheumatoid arthritis-like presentation. And a half of patients have required steroid sparing agents, be it milder agents like Plaquenil or sulfasalazine uh, or methotrexate or biologics. Um, and 27% of our patients have either rheumatoid factor and or CCP antibodies. These are the antibodies that are uh, uh, antibody markers of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and we think that our registry is relatively representative of what's out there in the world. This is a systematic uh, literature review that my fellow Neil Ashagash did with some medical students over the summer. Um, and in the cases and case series reported in the literature, similarly, 50 to 65 percent have this rheumatoid arthritis presentation. And the distribution is about similar to what we have, with one notable difference. We have 27 percent of our patients are seropositive compared to 9% in the literature. And if you hear Laura Capelli talk about her cohort in uh, Baltimore, virtually none of her patients are seropositive. And that tells us that there's an important uh, a role for the underlying genetics of the patient and the patient cohort uh, that determines uh, what the phenotypic uh, presentation is going to be of their adverse event. 
And in fact, Laura has looked uh, uh, at one genetic marker, a very important one in rheumatoid arthritis, the shared epitope. This is a five amino acid motif that is shared by certain HLA-DR beta molecules, which is strongly associated with CCP positive rheumatoid arthritis in smokers. And in her cohort, uh, if you had checkpoint inhibitor arthritis, you were twice as likely to carry at least one allele of the shared epitope compared to healthy controls. Uh, and the prevalence was as comparable to RA, although homozygosity uh, was lower. And the interesting thing is that this was despite the fact that those patients uh, were, uh, except for one of them, CCP negative. Uh, there are other similarities to rheumatoid arthritis. Um, this is one synovial biopsy that was presented at the ACR meeting last year compared to an RA synovial biopsy. Similar distribution of immune cells, uh, but a much higher uh, expression of TNF. Um, interestingly, um, if you look uh, at patients who've been treated with nivolumab, these are not arthritis patients, but just cancer patients who've received nivolumab, and you ask the question, what, what genes are upregulated and which are downregulated, uh, there's this nivolumab-induced gene signature. Um, and Guo did an interesting study where he asked the question, well, are these same genes uh, up and down regulated in rheumatoid arthritis? And the answer was yes in either established or early RA or undifferentiated arthritis on its way to RA, you see expression of these very same uh, genes uh, in contrast to healthy controls or to osteoarthritis uh, patient. So what this means is that when you give nivolumab, you're in essence creating a, a gene expression milieu which is identical to what we see in established rheumatoid arthritis, and so it shouldn't be uh, totally surprising that some of these patients actually present with RA. But there are also some differences between checkpoint inhibitor arthritis and uh, native rheumatoid arthritis, and this is some of the uh, preliminary work that we've done. We did uh, mass cytometry on synovial fluid immune cells and asked the question, are there populations in the synovial fluid, the joint fluid, uh, that distinguish these patients, the checkpoint inhibitor patients, from rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis? And we did, develop, we did identify a, a population that was clearly distinct in the checkpoint inhibitor-treated patients, characterized by CD38 positive and uh, absent or low CD127. These cells are proliferating, so they're active, um, and uh, we're doing studies to figure out exactly what these cells are, what they respond to, and what they do. And a similar CD4 positive uh, T cell population with these same markers uh, was also found in the checkpoint inhibitor patients uh, and to a much lesser degree in RA or psoriatic arthritis. Um, cytokines, uh, we have not found them hugely uh, helpful uh, distinguishing uh, patients from either controls or RA patients, but we did notice very high levels of CXCL13 in the checkpoint inhibitor treated patients compared to RA and especially to OA. Um, CXCL13 is a chemokine uh, that serves to attract B cells to lymphoid follicles, which are usually in the lymph nodes, but in the case of RA, you can have lymphoid follicles in the synovium, and in some cases in tumors, you can have lymphoid follicles in the, in the tumor microenvironment uh, as well. So um, this, all of these together suggest that there are a number of targets you can imagine uh, targeting uh, for, for treatment of checkpoint inhibitor arthritis, um, TNF, uh, CD8 positive T cells, CD4 positive T cells, or based on the CXCL13 uh, information, uh, B cells. Um, so uh, one of the problems that we have with checkpoint inhibitor arthritis, it's not gonna kill you, that's for sure, but it tends to be chronic. Um, and this is just a figure uh, showing the treatments that our patients have gotten in the registry over time. Blue shows no treatment, red is low-dose prednisone, and the gold is high-dose prednisone. And then this bar shows various steroid sparing agents, including hydroxychloroquine and then uh, methotrexate and some of the biologics. And so the, the take-home message here is that this is not an acute problem that's gone in two, four, or six weeks. It seems to be a persistent problem. So all of the issues with safety of immunosuppression um, that uh, are addressed with other immune-related adverse events where you might be talking about one or two doses of infliximab become much more important in our cohort because we may be talking about very long-term treatment. Um, and you saw this uh, study this morning, if you were here, uh, we know that high-dose steroids are bad actors. This is uh, patients treated uh, for hypophysitis with either high-dose steroids or just replacement-dose steroids, and you can see that those that got high-dose steroids had uh, a halving of survival. 
So uh, I'll take you through some of the biologics that we use uh, for rheumatic diseases and uh, talk about rationale for their use in this setting um, and uh, whether we've had experience using them. So TNF, uh, at least in the acute setting, is probably a bad actor in terms of, of cancer control. It increases pdl one expression on tumor cells. Um, when cytotoxic T cells do their work, it causes them to die and activation-induced cell death. And TNF also uh, acutely increases uh, T, cell, T regulatory cell proliferation. So none of those are good things, and you would think it would be good to inhibit TNF in the cancer setting. And if you look in vitro at tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, um, and you add dexamethasone versus infliximab, you, uh, dexamethasone has a much more powerful anti-cytotoxic effect than does infliximab. So uh, you would think that a TNF inhibitor would actually be uh, preferable in terms of management of IRAE. And this is a study uh, many people saw that was published recently in Nature in an animal model of, um, of uh, immunotherapy-induced colitis where TNF inhibition not only treated the colitis, but actually prolonged survival. So TNF inhibitors are really our kind of our go-to biologic in patients who are refractory um, to uh, require high-dose steroids um, or are, are refractory to, uh, uh, to milder agents. And we've used them in about 14 percent of our, of our patients. Um, IL-6 is another attractive target. Um, we know that IL-6 is associated with poor survival in cancers in general and also in immunotherapy-treated cancers. Uh, this is just a figure showing baseline and also week 12 IL-6 levels uh, showing high levels associated with poor outcomes. Um, IL-6, uh, as you probably know, t uh, targets through the JAK-STAT or signals through the JAK-STAT pathway. Um, that pathway is, again, pro-tumorigenic. It leads to proliferation uh, and survival and invasiveness of tumor cells. And uh, that pathway also strongly suppresses anti-tumor immune responses. So again, sounds like it would be a good thing to target. Uh, but the problem is that this same pathway is responsible for the expression of PD-1 on T cells or PD-L1 on tumor cells. And so if you're trying to get a patient better by targeting PD-1 or PD-L1 and you've blocked its expression, uh, you may interfere with uh, anti-cancer responses. And there were uh, case reports of patients with mutations in uh, JAK1 and JAK2 who, were, who had cancer and were resistant to PD-1 blockade. Uh, and so for that reason, um, I, try, I really only use IL-6 receptor blockade um, in patients who are refractory to uh, TNF inhibition, but I think the level of evidence is, is pretty weak at this point, knowing which is safer. Uh, there was a case series of three patients who received a tocilizumab anti-IL-6 receptor for arthritis, and their arthritis did get better, but two of the three had cancer progression, so it does, uh, does give you pause. Uh, and I generally avoid JAK-STAT inhibitors uh, for the reasons that I mentioned. Uh, so how about targeting uh, IL-17 or TH17 pathways? So these pathways are important in the spondyl arthropathies, ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, and psoriasis. And so you would think about using them in this subset of patients that has uh, enthesitis and tenosynovitis. Um, we have uh, two agents, at least that we use in rheumatology, that target uh, TH17 pathways, secukinumab that blocks IL-17A, and ustekinumab that blocks um, both IL-12 and, and 23, so 12 is on the TH1 pathway and 23 in the TH17 pathway. Uh, there are no reports of using ustekinumabs for uh, for, although I just heard about, uh, uh, I guess, in colitis, certainly not in any uh, rheumatic uh, complications. Um, and uh, actually, there, ha there have not been uses of secukinumab for inflammatory arthritis either, but there was this somewhat worrisome uh, case report that was in the New England Journal uh, of a colon cancer patient who received a third-line uh, pembrolizumab uh, and then received a dose of secukinumab uh, for a psoriasiform uh, rash from checkpoint inhibitors. And you can see the CEA level that was declining uh, and the dose of secukinumab is given. The psoriasis goes away, but almost immediately the CEA started to rise. So this uh, gives me some concern, although from what I heard about the responses of uh, colon cancer to checkpoint inhibitors this morning, maybe um, this patient would have uh, gotten worse anyway, but at least it suggests that there's an important role for TH17 responses in colon cancer. 
Uh, CTLA-4-IG, which is abatacept or Arencia, we have avoided its use because it does the opposite of what ipilimumab does, um, but there was a recent case report of its use. We'll probably hear about this in uh, refractory myocarditis. And um, I would certainly avoid it if you can in ipilimumab-treated patients, but if you have a life-threatening uh, or very, very severe high-grade uh, adverse event in a PD-1 or PD-L1 block, blockade uh, treated patient who is, say, refractory to other options, um, this, this is something to consider, and I recently used it in a patient with eosinophilic fasciitis who also had a history of MS and therefore couldn't receive a variety of other agents like TNF inhibitors and IL-6 blockers. And then finally, B cell targeted therapy. Uh, so B cells produce antibodies, but they also serve as antigen presenting cells. And this is a good target in RA. We do use rituximab in RA. And I think this is particularly helpful in patients who have checkpoint inhibitor associated arthritis who have an underlying lymphoma. And that's really where I've used it, where I have concerns about using uh, TNF uh, blockade um, or other agents. And I will stop there and uh, take questions. And please send us your patients. Hey, questions for Ann. Yeah, Omar. Just one quick one. Uh, I have yet to, I mean, I, my patients are doing a lot of everything joint wise, especially small joints, but I've yet to actually see any destructive joints. Like, uh, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Right. There, there have been some reports of erosion seen on ultrasound. Um, you know, erosive disease doesn't develop overnight. Um, so I can't really answer the question as to how erosive this is going to be. Some people have very mild arthritis, and most of our patients uh, can be managed with NSAIDs or low-dose prednisone. There are some patients with very, very highly uh, active disease, you know, hospitalized and um, uh, very, very refractory. I don't yet know whether those patients will uh, go on to have uh, erosive disease, but uh, certainly they need therapies just to, to maintain function. Right. We do a lot of joint uh, for the big joint. Joint injections. Inject. Joint injections are good. Plaquenil is a nice mild drug that you can add, and it takes two to three months to work. So if you can afford that, that's great. It's really the, the problem we have is are, are with the ones with very aggressive arthritis or the ones where ten of prednisone isn't controlling it and they're really uh, having trouble functioning. Thank you very much, Ann. That's great.